and welcome to Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington, and my great partner, Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Hello, Tom. How are you? Really good. I'm, I'm, we're going to um, have to speak really well tonight because being a special episode on the theme of oracy. <laughs> um, I'm going to enunciate very well throughout. Um, and we've got two brilliant guests we're looking forward to talking to. First of all, uh, Nikki Sullivan. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Tom. Hello, Emma. Hello, Rachel. How are you? All really good. Very excited to speak to you. And and Rachel Higginson. So hello, Rachel. Hello. Lovely to be here. OK, so we, we wanted to invite you both on because kind of, I don't know, these things ha have waves of, of interest. And of course, there's been an Oracy Commission and in the UK, um, I, I think various parties are talking about oracy as a thing and it's been debated on Twitter and so on. So we just thought we want to talk to people who know what, what it is. <laughs> and you two are are those people. So uh, let's just tell people a bit about what you're up to and, and where you work and so on to give people a bit of background before we get into the oracy. So, Nikki, do you want to go first? Tell, tell people kind of what you're doing and, and, you know, what kind of work you're up to at the moment. Yeah, so my name is Nikki Sullivan. I'm a deputy head teacher for teaching and learning and staff professional development at Beckford School in Bradford. Um, I also do some work for walkthroughs. And most recently, I have been co-authoring a book with Kelly uh, Heaton and Lucy Loud, who both work at my school, uh, entitled Unlocking Oracy. And it's part of the Inner Drive series that we're collaborating on with Bradley Bush uh, and, and Inner Drive. And we're approaching it very much from a what does this actually look like on the ground in schools and um, particularly through a secondary lens we're aware that we can't um, cover everything we don't have the specialism for example in early years to do it justice um, I don't have a background in sociolinguistics but we're hoping that through that lens we can make something really accessible for teachers and leaders in school. Well sold to me I meant to be reading that. <laughs> That's fan that sounds fantastic. And and Rachel, what about you? What what's your background and in coming to this? Um, so my background is actually um in curriculum is my passion. Um, I set up my own business about seven years ago now after writing a um approved curriculum for a free school, and um. I'd learned so much researching curriculums around the world for five days. I decided to give up my business, um, my day job in leadership and um, start my own business. And that's taken me in many different directions. Um, and it's been very organic, but essentially um, my passion is still curriculum, but it's that's taken me down lots of different beautiful rabbit holes. But when I was doing this work, I, I sort of do curriculum work in schools and I'm a keynote speaker. It's all it's all really lovely. But I miss working with young people. So I set up a project called Finding My Voice um, because I noticed when I was in schools that there were often a group of children who weren't in class. And whenever I asked about the interventions they were getting, it was always very um, lovely and great stuff, but it was often quite inward looking. And I wanted to evolve something that was incredibly practical that they could take into their lives and get them back into the classroom. So that's how my interest in oracy began. So I started researching the power of oracy for personal development. Um, so that's been running for seven years. And um, now I've evolved it as a whole school approach with Mary Myatt. Um, and so that's the, the sort of passion of oracy. That's where that area is. But I'm also, I do lots of work with Mary and I'm a collaborator on Myatt and Co as well. So yeah. Oh, sorry, it was quite a long story there, wasn't there? I didn't need that to happen. It just rolled out of my mouth. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> are good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask you this then, because this is I and I, I think Nikki, we had this discussion about about your book that before, almost before you can start talking about oracy, the sort of almost the first question is, well, what are you talk what are you talking about? Um and when you say the word oracy, what do you mean? Um what what is it? Uh, and so I don't know. Let's let's swap it around, <laughs> Rachel. What do you, when you're saying oracy, what do you mean? Um, it's taken on a deeper meaning for me personally. Um, it was originally coined by Andrew Wilkinson to bring um, speaking and listening. Um, 
but also the art of speaking and thinking out loud in line with literacy and um, numeracy. Um, and actually way before him, if you go back in history in education, people have been forever saying, but, but what about um, how we talk and how we listen, and how we communicate? Um, and it's one of those things that's so organic that we often miss it. So for me, um, what, what the core meaning is in the way I translate it is if I don't speak out loud, am I even here? How, how it is used as a tool for young people to be present in the classroom. And, and that goes right from EYFS up to is, is actually having a presence as a human first, but also a learner. Well, wow, so it's it's not just um, yeah. So it's 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 got a, a deepness to it there. Um, but it's but and I, but and then we'll come to we'll come on to the practicalities in a minute. But it's sort of like you just said, it has to be something you can do. Um, but let's look. We're going to get all into that. But Nikki, what about you then? So when you're saying oracy, what are you thinking? Is it the same, or is it is your site different? Yeah, I think that Rachel and I would agree that at its heart, oracy is about speaking and listening, but. Some of the arguments around oracy and what it is come through that kind of dual dimension that we have where oracy is both a means, so a means to support and strengthen teaching learning in the classroom, but also an end in and of itself where we want to ensure that students are leaving school, whether that be primary, secondary, sixth form, university, um, with the knowledge and skills to be able to communicate confidently confidently and, and utilize their voice in the way that's that's right for them and, and right for a range of situations. Um, but I think at times, even though oracy does have this kind of dual meaning, you know, I've recently posted a thread and said, well, let's take the word party. Are you picturing pass the parcel or are you picturing sticky floors in a DJ? If we take retrieval practice, are we talking about within a scheme or across a scheme? And so actually language has a, a range of meaning baked in so yes it's hard we've got speaking and listening but actually if we're going to have really powerful conversations about oracy and what it can look like in schools then we need to often drill down into the detail and and be clear about what aspect of oracy specifically we we want to discuss so is there a piece of work then around initially as a profession kind of and i think you posted this on your thread nikki about this idea of definitions, principles and practices that that needs understanding, this kind of collective understanding that before we can start, I don't want to say do anything about it, but before we can refine practice or begin to make it central to our practice. Yeah, I think absolutely. I, I think about its kind of layers of detail. If I just say, you know, Oracy is speaking and listening, that's doing a massive disservice. But if I jump all the way through to the other end and say, here's a really specific practice and let's talk about that without considering the principles that sit underneath it and without um, considering that broader definition, then we can end up with maladaptive practice or kind of min minimising or belittling what it is. So I think you're absolutely right. We've got to build up those layers of detail um, to enable those conversations and to enable you know practice to be evaluated and developed in schools yeah i i think just to add to that nikki um it's really fascinating the semantics of education i was in a meeting this morning and i was like can we just all discuss right now what we mean by inclusion because it was really clear from the way the leaders in the room were, were discussing it they all had a different perception of what that meant and i think it's exactly the same for oracy and anyone who's you know been living this for their whole career we'll talk about sort of the dialogic classroom and this this entire culture of talk that's far deeper than how someone who may perceive um oracy who's looking at it purely from um a teaching and learning point of view to get some think pair share in to go a bit deeper sometimes you know so i think we we really do need to have important conversations around what oracy needs to be right now for our young people. Because I think if we're not connecting this to the sort of crisis we're seeing with the online world and mental health, then we might be missing a trick. So that's why I, I keep pushing this conversation to be about the young people themselves. So is there a, is there a danger, do you think, that, that we get people who, because there's noise in the room, and because there's voices in the room and because there's words being said that they're kind of going, ah, oh, brilliant. There it is. <laughs> we've got we've got talk going on. Therefore, big tick done. Yeah. Yeah. 
hundred percent. And and this is what Tom and I have had some conversations on threads about. Um, and um, within Finding My Voice, we've got what's called the authentic oracy model, because what I think is really important is that first and foremost, young people um, grow self-awareness about the way in which you effectively communicate and listen. And, and so within um, our model, we have this collaborating aspect, which is really learning the mechanics of listening, responding, building and growing a conversation. And, you know, that that is it's really important that we understand that there's a whole set of really deeply human but need they these skills need to be taught within the classroom for for the cognitive benefits to to really thrive because what we have to remember is oracy when we're speaking with you know right now I'm talking my thoughts out loud you know it's that cognition is so powerful but also because it's something that I live and breathe I'm excited <laughs> and you know it's it's that sort of limbic connection and that compelling element where actually I'm far more engaged because it's something I'm passionate about so I think yeah we we really need to be a lot more conscious of it's not ask a question now talk about it in your groups it's it's so much deeper than that it's interesting because I, I, you know, I, 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 I tend to be the kind of driven by uh, being quite pragmatic and, and functional about these things because in the discussions I'm having, when someone says it's deeper than that, I'm, I'm always worried that that what what they want to do is is like bypass the like they almost feel like talking about really good think pair share is somehow too perfunctory to sort of be troubled with and. And so it's when it's deeper than that, it, it, it's about, it, it, you have to sort of see the bigger picture, but then sometimes the way into that is through a, a, a technique. And I, I really believe that. So and I, so I, I watch lessons every week. I see many lessons and it's the thing I'm totally obsessed with it <laughs> is sitting at, I always sit at the back and I'm totally obsessed with what actually happens when a teacher says, okay, turn to your partner. I just find it, I just, I like, okay, I'm like to I just sit there, so I'm try not to be too, no, to let them notice me, and I just listen. And sometimes the way kids exchange ideas uh, is so sort of far from what the teacher's intentions were. It's kind of, it's kind of amusing, but, but also it, you just think, well, that, actually, without some real structure here, the truth is yeah. most of the children here aren't speaking, and they're not speaking very well, and they're not speaking, they're not finding their voice, they're just kind of going through the motions. So you've got to kind of have this thing of structure and technique that yeah. ensures that proper dialogue is happening and speaking is happening. And if you then don't have that structure, what ten teachers tend to do then is rely on shortcuts because, because of busyness. And one of the shortcuts is on your tables, have a chat. <laughs> and yeah. that's even worse than just turn to your partner without any structure. And the other shortcut is whole class discussion and you can get vibing off like the five or eight children who are really participating. I think, whoa, this is really rocking here. But actually, the majority of the class are just sort of tennis, like what's happening. And so to me, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's about both, isn't it? Not, and we could talk about which comes first, but that, 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 just that thought process, does everyone get a chance to speak in my lessons? It's quite a big yeah, question. So that, yeah, no, it's when I when I say it's deeper than that, I think that that it what I'm talking about is the the whole set of precursors that come before I think pair share can even begin to be successful. Like I need to be self-aware, I need to understand how my body language might be portrayed by my partner, how it's important to look at them when they're talking to me. I need to make sure that the social norms are curated in my classroom so that we're all feeling really confident and we understand that we one of our intentions is to collaborate to learn and actually when we're talking we're thinking out loud together we need to understand that you know there's a metacognitive element to this that really mm. supports it as well but i you know I've, within finding my voice there's a whole training sequence on think pair share and and it's quite a while before it even gets to the think bit because there's so much for teachers to be conscious of in mm. how that is enacted Things like the pairings themselves, you know, I, I've I've done a lot of talking to young people about this and they really like to be someone with someone they know really well that they can feel really vulnerable with so they can really share their thoughts deeply. This sort of 
pairing in an artificial clunky way just doesn't get the best out of think pair shares so, you know there's there's just so many and actually the thinking element just stopping thinking writing notes you know and then when you're asking them to share you're preparing the ground for what you expect their responses to be you know I could go into every detail of it, but like you, Tom, I've yeah. agonized over it because I've experienced watching it. I've spoken to the learners about how it feels. And when then when it's done right, it's such a rich and powerful experience of of real um there's a real shift of um the teacher being the protagonist and the delivery of of the learning and then the learners actually feeling really autonomous in and vibing with that lesson themselves in a really powerful way i was just thinking i was just reflecting when you're talking rachel about the think pair share because i was in a school recently and there were a few incidents with think pair share where the, one of the children had to get up and go to the toilet or leave the room so the partner just carried on talking into the air <laughs> 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 and then just carried because she was in the chair bit I just uh, this is what I do I just talk now <laughs> oh, gorgeous. Where ask them to face each other to talk which is interesting what you say about the norms and some of them did and then some of them just didn't so some of them were literally talking into the side of somebody's head rather than actually face to face and then there was um, another one where a child hadn't got a partner and the teacher hadn't clocked it. And the child said to this other pair, can I join in a three? And they just went, no, and just carried on. So this poor child <laughs> just sat by themselves. So it's like, there's all of these kind of weird little bits yeah. and bits about those social norms. You know, it's not a social norm to just carry on talking into thin air when your partner yeah, exactly, gets to the point. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah. do it, we have to get into that and... I mean, this is, I mean, I, I could write a long, long list. In fact, I have. <laughs> of loads of examples where, like, the dynamics are just not right. I'm, I'm thinking of one one pair spring to mind is boys in year 10, where they were talking. And one of the boys was, he knew tons. Like, he, he knew everything, uh, really. He was very knowledgeable. But he was quite shy. And he sort of didn't really feel he needed to talk to his partner because he knew the answers already. But his partner was the one who loved talking and he, and his, he was really, he didn't know, he didn't understand it at all. But he needed to, he sort of just told his friend all this sort of bad science while his friend sort of humoured him and just, like, it was just, I was thinking, oh, this is wrong. Like, we don't, they don't know how to exchange, like, ideas. And so I think, I think it's, I'm going to say this, I'm going to ask Nikki what she thinks, but my feeling is this, we have to be careful not to make it sound too complicated because I actually don't think it is that complicated. It's true. Otherwise people say, it's too well it's not worth trying it's just too big a thing to to do and then they avoid avoid even making these changes to practice where think even something as common as think pair share is just really done well because it can be done yeah brilliantly well so nikki what's your take on this thing of like the techniques and how it sits in a, in a wider frame yeah in terms of sitting within the the wider frame the approach that we've taken in the book is that we've kind of threaded um, strategies that lean upon students speaking and listening with um, Daniel Willingham's simple model of memory because it isn't about doing oracy. Now, don't get me wrong, I absolutely do think we can view our schools through an oracy lens and consider whether our students are getting the experiences that they need in terms of that in the same way that we could view a school through a literacy lens you know have we got sufficient intervention for students whose reading age is below chronological and have we got this that and the other so although we can view our school provision through an oracy lens when it comes to kind of in the classroom we can't say oh we're doing oracy well actually are we at the stage of rehearsal where we need to get students familiar with the academic language that we're teaching them or is it we're utilizing um speaking and listening as part of a retrieval activity or is this part of making meaning and are the students considering how what we've just um included as part of our exposition links with something that they already know and by making sure that we're considering those practices in the context of, you know, what we normally talk about as pedagogy, I think we're more likely to see speaking and listening threaded through more classrooms, as opposed to seeing it's kind of a separate lofty goal in and of itself. Yes, it is important, but actually, if we want to see this materialise in the classroom, then we've got to see it as a as a thread through our pedagogy. And, and in terms of the detail of, of the techniques, I think you're absolutely right. You know, the difference between turn and talk to your partner go and 
window first, then wall, and one idea, then three ideas, or everyone has to include the word um, osmosis in their discussion. You know, there's so many nuances that we have to be thinking about there when we're looking at these techniques. And particularly from a secondary perspective, I think we also need to be seating it within the subject lens. So if we just take one of, uh, you know, one of my favourite notions that I keep thinking about at the minute about um, an acceptable range of meaning, okay, an acceptable range of meaning in something like science at times can be really narrow. And at other times, perhaps in English literature, it can be much more broad. And how does something something like that influence the way in which we might set up a think pair share activity so again we've got that those layers of detail where we have to have the principles we have to know why we we might use a speaking and listening activity you know what purpose is it serving in our pedagogy we've got to dig into the detail and we've got to seat that within within the age the stage and the subject that that we're teaching i'm just That's thinking brilliant. it's such a quick i don't mean a quick win um, but it's such a win in terms of understanding what children are thinking as well. And if half the battle with teaching is not knowing what's going on in children's heads because learning and thinking is invisible, then actually making it audible is such an easy, swift win in terms of it takes quite a while to write something down. It doesn't take very long to say anything. Um, potentially so it's such a swift way of assessing things that we can't see or can't access or then have to kind of read um so for me it's an absolute <laughs> no brainer and if i if i can jump in there i mean one of the words i keep talking about is this notion of affordances okay mm -hmm. so i love a mini whiteboard i'm obsessed with a mini whiteboard okay but that doesn't mean it's my only tool to check for understanding and it affords me different opportunities to circulating during a think pair share discussion and so instead of saying it's only this it's like okay well here's my toolkit and which tool is the right tool for the job at the right time um, we absolutely need to know what students know and understand. And a mini whiteboard is one way to do it. But actually, particularly if the answers are longer or more fulsome, then I can't read all 30 of those boards. So I might up participation, but I probably won't be um, checking for understanding as, as holistically or successfully as if I'm circulating the room and listening into those discussions. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, you know, it, it, so talk, if, even the simple structure of paired talk, can have um, many values and, and one of them can be to help them check their understanding. Another one, it depends again on, on the subject, starting to them hearing them speak, so themselves speak. And, I, and I, I, my main environment for this is adults. And I find this is true with adults. Like when you get people talking, <laughs> like the room is full of, but you have to have accountability. That's the thing I find is key. So you've got to say, I want you to talk about this. And then I'm gonna ask some people to just share your thoughts and it could be you. And then it kind of makes them do it. And then whenever you ask people, they just always have loads to say. And, and it's almost like you just heard yourself express these ideas to your part, to your colleague. And you kind of realise you have opinions you might not have realised. Right? You're having to sort of organise your thoughts and speak almost reveals part of yourself to yourself, doesn't it? Because this is what I say when I'm asked this question. It's, and I find that kind of quite profound. Um, it is really profound. And, you know, that comes right back to Vygotsky's social cultural theory of, you know, that that using that environment of everyone talking around you to, to form your inner thoughts. And, and, you know, we very much see the process of coming for a te from a teacher into a child's head and then the child speaks it out loud. But actually, we know that that peer talk is also incredibly val valuable and I remember you, I think he wrote the inaction book of the extended mind, you know, it always makes me think of Annie Murphy Paul's work of, you know, the thinking just doesn't just happen inside our heads, you know, it is through, I'm a terrible gesture, I'm like, I move all the time, I can't sit, but that's how I express myself. But actually, when I talk to people, it builds and grows, it feeds my cognition, it deepens the meaning for me. And I think that's the bit we need to be really aware of. So where, where's, let, let's think of, because I mean, I mean, to be honest with you, if someone just said, yeah, look, talk about think, pair, share for the next uh, 25 minutes, I would just say, yeah, let's do it because <laughs> I'm well up for that. I, I actually think it's, it's so interesting. I, it I and I, there's, I've seen some really great questions recently and then, um, so, you know, things which, things which worked well, things which didn't work well. Um, 
And, and one of the things I, you know, Graham Nuttall's brilliant work on hidden lives of learners. It's so, I always have to remind people of that, like when, unless you're checking and, and sampling and being conscious of what might be happening and you're really thinking about that, you're just leaving it to chance. All kinds of stuff is happening at that table over there that is not good unless you think about it. So, but what else is there, you see? So I feel like in my last job as a head, one of the, there are a few things that, out of the ashes of that job I still feel reasonably proud of and one of them was our work on oracy or we called it rhetoric because we we were trying to follow Martin Robinson's trivium and um, I still think it's a brilliantly profound structure for for curriculum thinking but rhetoric is a great concept for communicating ideas but we kind of I think got a little bit over over sort of driven by sort of set piece um, events and we, we use this phrase structured speech events so you could list things like debate presentation in front of the class you know, things like audio guides in geography you know role play performance in drama um and so on and so on and speak actual speeches to an audience which kids in languages standing up and reciting from memory their account of themselves in the language they were learning and some of recitation learning poetry by heart there were just honestly tons and tons and i think we kind of overcooked it a bit but it was exciting for to get people thinking about all the different ways speaking could find its way into the curriculum so so what do you think i mean without it seeming like you're sticking that on top of a packed curriculum are there more ways that you think teachers could be developing authentic oracy in through the curriculum? Rachel, what do so, you think? Yeah, I think I've, I've got a million thoughts going on my head. But first of all, I think we need to think about what oracy is not. And oracy is not a silver bullet. You, you, oracy isn't the answer to all of our problems. And I think um, within Finding My Voice, we've developed a model that combines what I see as all the different elements that are that do make a perfect marriage um, and what can happen is we get really excited about one element of oracy and what tends to happen in a lot of schools is it is the presenting element um, that's not to negate from that that the skill and art of rhetoric is incredibly powerful when I think about presenting um, with, it is part of our model in finding my voice but how I always articulate it to people is it's not just um, being able to give a speech, although that is the research around what happens to the self through taking that risk and doing that is incredibly powerful, actually, in its own right. But what that becomes channeled into is being able to have challenging conversations. So when I'm in conflict with my friend, I can channel this, I can switch into a more formal tone and I can actually navigate something tricky. When I'm with a consultant when I'm older and you know I really know I'm not getting the best care, I can advocate for myself. So it's that more formal element of speech that's really powerful. But also within that is the drama element and disassociation where I can really explore some deep thoughts and feelings about the world that actually might be really connected to me, but in a really safe way. You know, there's so much research around that, too. Um, but the other thing that I think that we miss within um, oracy and we use it very um, sort of obsessively as a tool for learning or presenting is, is the exploratory element. So once we've really established um, the ability to collaborate, um, within the classroom, we're doing great think pair share is really taking it to the next level, which I have successfully done with kids at risk of exclusion, because I know so I know it's possible is to take things um, to a place where those learners are really thriving and you can step back and you can watch something organic happen. So I go to great um, schools doing great oracy work but it's still at a very mechanical phase because those habits have been you know really well ingrained we've got these great um, sort of turn and talk and where whoever's talking in the class everyone's doing this big swoosh round to them but there's something missing still which is that we're learners in our own right we are thinking as a collective and that exploratory talk element I think is for me that's the goosebumpy bit and when you know it when you've got there 
um, and it looks different in different subjects. And I think we need to allow that as well. And But that's where the critical thinking happens. That's where the creativity happens. So oracy is more than think pair share, although I agree, Tom, I would love to spend an hour just talking about <laughs> that. <too. laughs> it does to as well that in things like turn and talk, the routine is there. It's beautiful. Everybody's doing it. Everyone's involved in it. But the actual quality of the conversation is that uh, it's still at that kind of disputational level or cumulative talk level. And it's not made that leap from disputational and cumulative to, to actually that rich exploratory talk level. Exactly. So there's exactly. kind of a, a body of work from the performative element, which is yeah. necessary to yeah. get to the the deep exactly exploratory. that yeah and that's why it's an evolving model within finding my voice because i think one has to come before the other you have to go but for some reasons classes get quite stuck in that sort of mechanical level and so it's it's how you can really be con conscious of your class culture and that's where the compelling curriculum comes in of how having something that you know everyone just can't wait to talk about because they're so into it and so that's about the enactment of your curriculum itself and the influence that has on talk is profound as well so there's that's why it's not just oracy it's about all the things that are in the context of oracy to make oracy really thrive wow so much to think about um nikki what about you what's your what's what's your sense of this sort of like the kind of the, the kind of I don't know, the kind of smorgasbord of kind of possibilities that people, and this is why I guess why some people panic a bit because they, they think it's got, there's so much that we'd have to do and it feels like it would be added on and stuff. So what's your sense of beyond classroom structures and, and, and other wider things? Have you talked about that in your, your book? Yeah, I think Rachel's absolutely right that it's not about Oracy being a silver bullet. It's, it's about reviewing our, our school provision through that lens, but also considering let's look at our personal development program let's look at our extracurricular opportunities okay where are the gaps there actually we don't have a debate club we don't have model un we don't have mock trials we don't have anything lending itself to oracy within our extracurricular provision what would be appropriate for our school what's our first step in the same way as we might look at our extracurricular provision and say we're not offering enough um in individual sports here you know we need to be viewing our schools and determining what our individual next steps are we're looking at um curriculum opportunities so tom you were talking about kind of mode b teaching opportunities can i as subject leader look at my curriculum and recognize that actually there's written assessment after written assessment after written assessment and i absolutely can make space for a slightly different exciting enriching opportunity without detracting from um that you know high quality curriculum experience focusing on students knowing more and bring more and all of the other things besides and then it's down to that kind of smaller level of detail within the classroom for the classroom teacher if i'm teaching 22 periods a week my head isn't over here considering extracurricular or even necessarily mode b teaching but I, what i will be thinking about is yes you know it's it's not just think pair share my smorgasbord looks different and i want to think about plural response and I want to think about call and close so it, where students aren't just repeating words back to me but I'm giving that wait time in the whole class uh, you know filling in a gap I want to think about students um talking through word diagrams and explaining them back to their partner I want to think about using strategies like um Alex Quigley talks about a strategy called Just a Minute, where students have to talk for a minute about a particular topic and how that's a really useful retrieval activity. So I think instead of, you know, instead of saying, oh, let's do oracy, well, actually, let's review our classroom provision, uh, provision and, and what learning problems are we seeing and what tools might be useful here. And let's review our extracurricular and what might be useful here, because if we try and accomplish everything all at once, we're probably not going to achieve very much. <laughs> this is why like when 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 sometimes <clears throat> what to me is like a like a really good thing it's like what's not to like about developing kids capacity to speak with confidence and about themselves and with authenticity and yet when some people hear like we're going to have an, a wave of of activity around oracy they start panicking and thinking and people will say literally oh god no don't make oracy the next big thing um, now, why why do you think people react in that way, Rachel? What do, what do you think that's about? Why do people sort of go, go oh, God, what's this? Um, 
I think that's the general tone of change anyway, is, is I think we're a very lethargic profession. I think everyone's doing their best and working at capacity. And I think that's a natural response. Um, I, I also kind of agree that it's not, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It's not like, yeah, scrap everything. Let's do oracy now. It's far deeper and far richer than that. And this is what I've spent a very, very long time puzzling over because um, what we do with finding my voice is the filter is, um, and Nikki just talk, referred to looking for the learning problems. I know you've done something similar. And um, it comes um, from Sarah Cottingham's Sarah Cotting Hat now's research of um, sort of learning first in terms of teacher development. So, you know, what I always say is let's look what the learners need, where are they at, and then let's think what is the right thing to be doing today or in this lesson. And, and I think we, you know, the same across PE, for example, the power of talking PE is phenomenal. Um, so sometimes it's so much, and this is the beautiful thing about using this lens, it's so much about things you do that are really um, just ingrained within your practice, that are the essence of what you love, but you don't get to sing about very much. So, you know, having those team talks at the end of a di difficult match, using that as a collaborative talk, you know, really getting people to express how they're feeling about it and to move that conversation forward navigate that difficult moment and and come up with a plan for the next training session you know that that's what oracy looks like in in a PE lesson um if we're thinking about the complexity of some really hard poetry and we're just not getting those grade nines scrap everything for a lesson and get them to talk deeply about a poem then watch what they write in the next lesson you know so it's really about looking at the learners seeing where the beauty of that subject is or where they are and then applying something from that so yeah I, I don't even remember what the question was anymore <laughs> I, was, I was talking about why people like why why people sort of like sort of balk a little bit uh, you know say you know oh, yeah. We, yeah. let's say we have a new government and it becomes an initiative and then I and mean, I think it's probably because to some extent people are, have a you know a justifiable resistance to sort of official initiatives which then end up being kind of corrupted into audits and checklists and which sounds which just sounds like workload 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely. But also it's scary. And I think, you know, Oracy is a, a teacher act as well. You know, there's an awful lot. It puts a lot of demands on the teachers. And whenever we talk about Oracy in the classroom, we're talking about teacher Oracy as well. And in that, that, mm. that takes a lot more self-awareness effort. And actually, although we're very happy in the classroom, a lot of teachers are naturally introverts. And so, you know, I think that in itself is is quite scary as well. If you look at, I know I, I sit at, in a lot of staff meetings and you, you see people who aren't great listeners. You know, you see people just waiting for their turn to talk. And the beautiful thing about doing this work really deeply is how that changes the culture within the way in which you communicate as staff. So I think it's just being open to that and being willing to step through a bit of mess because it is messy when you first start trying to evolve this culture that's why the social norms and the evolution of those is so key do you think there might be and this is almost like the polar opposite is a nervousness about the fact you can't quantify it particularly well and it's difficult to assess and so it's difficult to spreadsheet how well you're doing <laughs> in our <assay. laughs> There was a, a blog that I read recently and I can't for the life of me remember the name of the author I have to to dig it out but they were basically talking about that kind of mutation that can happen from because we can't measure it may, maybe we shouldn't do it and maybe actually it's not a thing and therefore maybe let's not talk about it at all because it can't be popped in a spreadsheet and I think um you know we we need to be making sure that we're doing what's right for our students and doing what's right for our schools and considering what that looks like formatively as opposed to trying to put a number or a percentage on something all of the time and actually you know if leaders in schools are saying right I'm going to come around with my checklist and I'm going to come around with my clipboard and I'm going to count how long students are speaking for you know and things like that have happened and that's why people freak out about it and I think um 
you know, we can all end up in the land of false dichotomy where it suddenly becomes, oh, teachers shouldn't be talking and teachers shouldn't be, you know, sharing their knowledge as the expert in the room and so on and so forth. And it's not a, it's not about that. It's about making sure we've got that balance right. And I think some people are saying in some schools, are students going from lesson to lesson to lesson to lesson, having said nothing? Yeah. Possibly. And how do we feel about that? And is that supporting their learning? But that's not to say that's the case in every school, which is why it's not about doing oracy. It's about, you know, eval evaluating teaching learning, evaluating extracurricular provision and looking what's going on with, within our context. I, I mean, I, I think it's definitely true. And I mean, sometimes, you know, these things get sort of pigeonholed. And I mean, I've been to schools where, you know, primary and to, I think of a primary school and a secondary school, which had like sort of silent corridor transitions for kind of like, behavior reasons and just this you know sort of kind of calmness reasons and then you went into the classroom and they all they probably spoke more french in the first 10 minutes of the french lesson than i would see in in many other schools or the dialogue in the english lesson was structured purposeful everyone was engaged disciplined but fulsome compared to the other schools where they were sort of balk at the idea of silent corridors because that was sort of against their culture and yet in their lessons half the kids don't speak because the structures aren't present to ensure that they do. And you're sort of thinking, you've got to sort of take a view of what's happening in our actual school here. What's what's the state of play with talk? So I do think a bit of awareness of kind of, it's a bit like, you know, reading. How many words a day do your children read? What Like how many children, day, words a day do they say? That's, that's And, and I, I think it's worth thinking about that and finding avenues. And you mentioned mode A, mode B. I feel like, that's the answer. Like, I, I think there are some things where someone needs to sort of take a view across a curriculum. So let me let me say something like this. I, if let's say at key stage three, I would say surely somewhere in three years, every child should sort of stand up, up in front of an audience and make us uh, give a presentation like to learn to learn that skill, to experience that feeling of hearing themselves about something they, they chose um this it's like this is what i care about let me tell you or it could be a small group um and some kids never get that experience because it's not built into any part of the curriculum so they never have, know what that's like and, and i don't know i mean do you think that's too formulaic i mean rachel what do you think about that do you think that should be something we can organize yeah i think um it's it's really important to consider um you know, you have like these 50 things to do by the time you leave X school, those sort of things. And and I really like that as a, as a mode of flow and accountability. But sometimes what it does is it, it ticks it off in people's heads. And so it doesn't organically come where it fits. And so I think that um, in terms of presenting, for example, um, when I talk about that in schools, I talk about the fact that presenting is any moment you expect a child to stand up in front of the class and present themselves like that can come in so many different lessons at different times and I just recommend having a tick sheet so you know who stood up recently this week and just have such you know simple modes and um, this is in primary of course of, of, of capturing that I think in second secondary what what we provide with finding my voice is just this, this um just to really consciously work out how much talk is happening because what what has been found in huge amounts of research is that that you know kids are going entire days with without speaking and 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 I don't believe that they are cognitively able to focus <laughs> and not talk for that length of time and also what worries me about young people particularly because I work very closely with them and I get inside their heads is that metaphorically their heads are on snapchat they are on tiktok and we need to bring them into the classroom so you know I think there's an even more important reason than there ever was before to make them present um but another just another to go back to that quantifying thing that emma said which i think is utterly fascinating and i've gone round the houses with this because people love to be able to you know say we've improved by this percentage this year what i what i do do on finding my voice is some baseline 
areas of how confident they feel about their learning, about how confident they feel in class, how confident they feel in who they are, and then measure that at the end of the year. And I think, you know, we can make our own metrics based on what's right for our young people where we see the problems are and that will be different in every school but you know I've worked in some schools where they just can't get kids to be quiet <laughs> and so you know they just want them to learn to listen and so that that's what they choose to focus on and measure you you know it's, so we can measure the things that matter if we choose to. Mm -hmm. Some level I just feel like you know that we, we devalue our 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 professional judgment our value capacity to evaluate and you know, I've, I've been to loads of schools, especially say two years ago, post you know COVID re return. So many schools were saying, I "Just look at them all that." They're all like these sort of like zombies <laughs> in, in rows, kind of. You know, and we need to get them back to talking again, and that was a massive thing. And it's like a qualitative thing. No one's measuring it; they're just looking at it. <laughs> like, look at it; it's like blood out of a stone. And then, you know, do you do you sense that six months later or a year later? And I've been to the same school like four times, say three months apart. And you go in, it's like, oh my God, look at this. Everyone's like the talk. It's like, it's just a change. It's, a, it's like a light's been switched on. And now once you get like flute talk being a kind of a, a celebrated, I mean, you have, you have people say things like, but what if, but what if there's nothing in their books? <laughs> like, I think, <laughs> just who, who, who are you talking about? Like, you're the teacher you're the you're the leader like who's who's who are you looking over your shoulder to to say oh there should be more in their books like it's your instinct to talk then that's what just do it you know and that that fit that's what i feel that like we need to we get we, <laughs> we go on a big old rant about this but it's, <laughs> it's that about confidence in, in ourselves is like if we feel this is an important thing that we should be doing in our school because it feels right and it's it's the place we want to be then we should make it so is it, then, Nikki and Rachel, about being comfortable with Oracy being ever so slightly mercurial? As in, you can't, you've got to accept that you can't necessarily spreadsheet it. You can create conditions in which you can be systematic about creating conditions in which it can thrive, but then you've got to kind of sit back and let it run. I, I think as well it's about looking at the macro and the micro, which is a kind of lens that I think I talk about a lot as a as a CPD lead in school. But if I want to, you know, as as has Tom, as Tom has talked about, consider whether students are speaking more because I recognise that actually as a school students are too passive and you know and how we want that to evolve over time, then I need that macro picture. But actually, if I'm really clear about what I'm doing in the classroom or as extracurricular or whatever else it might be and why I'm doing it then I, I can be slightly more clear so you know let's take a maths lesson for example um students need to be able to talk through a procedure but they also need to be able to talk about um the kind of declarative knowledge and why things are the way they are and what is a fraction and strengthen their procedural understanding in that way we've seen a big shift um on GCC exam papers to problem solving questions which are a lot longer and so students talking through the question and working out exactly what it's asking them is a tool to solve that problem and it wasn't happening in classrooms before and students couldn't really answer those kinds of questions and now I can see students talking through what is this question trying to get me to do? And now they can't they can answer those kinds of questions. So I think we need to make sure that we're looking at the macro. What are we trying to achieve in terms of our school, in terms of our culture, in terms of what it looks like? Big picture across classrooms, subject to subject, year seven to year 13. But also, what does it look like in, in the micro? What does it look like? So Rachel gave a, you know, a brilliant example from PE. What does it look like there? What does it look like in maths? In in creativity, um, are students using, you know, we've worked on ethic of excellence um, because of Sonia Thompson's work looking at Ron Berger's framework uh, and how they evaluate their own and others' work. Well, can I see that in the classroom? And actually, mm -hmm. I know what that looks like. So I think it's looking at the macro, but also looking at, at the micro. That is brilliant. I'm looking forward to your book. <laughs> so, yeah. Rachel, I mean, gosh, are we... We've been we, we we're getting the uh, the alert to fin to wrap up from our producer, and I hadn't I had literally no idea we were so close to the end. <laughs> like oh my god, I've only just got started. Um, oh. So Rachel, what 
just because I think people, you know, people want to, you, you've got this project going, just tell people, you know, how they can get in touch with you and what, what in, in, whether there's capacity you have, capacity to, for people to do more work with you, or just what they can read maybe. Um, yeah, we, we so um, currently we're running the course through the Hutt Academy, so um, we can add a link to that if you add links. Do you add links? Yeah, we can add links, yeah. Yeah, um, and but you can get in touch with me as well. So I also am doing some work with developing deeper sort of oracy curriculums. Um, I'm doing a whole Finding My Voice approach across uh, AP near London. So they're using Finding My Voice as their core curriculum for young people who are struggling to access education. So it's a, a, a 12 week program for them and then they go back in. So, you know, there's all different layers of finding my voice you can get, but basically we're trying to keep it simple. That's the essence of it. And also embrace the fact that it's not just oracy, it's all the different areas. So yeah, just get in touch. I love talking about it as you might have realized. <laughs> <laughs> When's your when's your when are we going to see um uh what what unlocking oracy when's that going to be coming out? So I've just pushed back the deadline <laughs> to submit it to, to Routledge, um, but I'm determined that it won't take up my entire summer holiday. So it's it's due to be in at the end of July, but I think publication will be six to twelve months after that. So it's it's a way off. We've been working on it um since kind of pre government announcements and all of that it's been a long time coming but it's still going to be a long time to come i think well i can't wait anyway we'll have to we'll have to get you on again to talk about that and, and talk to both of you so emma i think we do you think we acquitted ourselves okay with our with our um our speaking i jolly well hope so <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we're all look rather foolish in front of these two ladies. <laughs> Do you know that really made me laugh, Tom? Because when I was younger, um, my mum sent me to the local school, which was in you know it's quite a challenging area, and I developed a, a really strong Wiltshire accent, and I I loved my accent, but my mum didn't, and so she sent me to elocution, <laughs> and so that's <laughs> why I have this sort of funny, like almost their accent, but I'm essentially a Wiltshire girl, and I'm proud. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I mean, yeah, and you know, I. I think that we the sociolinguistics debate will be and for another day, but that's that's another thing which is so interesting. Yes. Well, look, honestly, brilliant. I I knew this would be great. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so thanks everyone for listening. Uh, another me mega episode for Mind the Gap. Um, we're really pleased with how many people are tuning in to to listen to us on on the podcast and on YouTube. It's something like, you know. Oh, always over two and a half thousand listens and then sometimes three thousand it's it's amazing and people listening in australia hello to you and in the us as well which is very exciting so keep listening um this is mind the gap making education work across the globe and we'll see you again really soon thank you Thank you for listening to Mind the Gap. I'm Emma Turner and I've been presenting with my co-host Tom Sherrington. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review, share on social media and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on our YouTube channel, search Mind the Gap with Tom and Emma or head over to Spotify for an audio version. This podcast was produced in association with Haringey Education Partnership and our producer for today's episode was Luke Kemper.